Uh, this week we talked about using a regression of returns in your stock against returns in a market index to learn something about your company. And in fact, I emphasize that when you run this regression, there are three pieces of output that are worth examining. The first is the intercept of the regression that tells you how good or bad your stock was as an investment during the period of your regression. Keyword is was. It's a postmortem, but you can get a risk-adjusted, market-adjusted measure of whether your stock was a good or a bad investment. Market adjusts in the sense of your stock, if the market went up 35%, you'd, you'd want your stock to not go up just 3% or 5%. You might want it to go up 40 or 50%. And risk adjusted in the sense that if you have a risky company, you want it to go up more than the market. So the market went up 35%. If you're a really risky company, you'd want it to go up 60, 70%. So the intercept tells you something about performance, and we went through that process in, in, of breaking down how to compare the intercept to the risk-free rate times one minus beta. The second piece of output from the regression, of course, is the slope of the regression, which is the beta. And that beta comes with a standard error. There's a range around that beta estimate. And the third is the R squared. That tells you something about where the risk in this company is coming from. So given that the mechanics are fairly straightforward, what I thought I would do in this webcast is actually take you through how to read a regression output and convert it into that, into being a, into those judgments we're trying to make about the company. Um, for simplicity, I'm going to use the Bloomberg beta page for Disney. But let's face it, if you don't have access to a Bloomberg, it's not the end of the world. In fact, I have I ran a, an actual Excel regression using exactly the same two years of weekly returns that Bloomberg used. And all you need is the following information. You need the stock price every month for Disney for 104 months. That's two years of weekly data. And, and I was able to get that. You can get that on Yahoo Finance. You can get that in lots of different places. You need dividends, if any, on the stock during those 104 weeks. In the case of Disney, it's going to be very simple because they pay dividends only once a year. I just had to find out when that dividend was, which happened to be in December of each of the years, what week it happened in, how much it was, and put it just in that week. So it's, it's actually very simple. I've just put it in. The third column you can actually ignore because most of the data services actually adjust stock prices for, for splits. So if you go to Yahoo and you look up past prices, if there's been a split, they give you the adjusted price. You can ignore this. This is in case that doesn't happen. If you have a data service that does not adjust for splits, which is very unusual, this allows you to make that adjustment by putting in the month of the split, and only in that month, what the split factor is. What I mean by that is if you have a two for one split, you'll put in two. If you have a five for one split, you'll put in five. So that allows you to convert the prices in that month. Then come two columns that are a little more difficult to get. The first column actually is easy. It's the S&P 500 every month, every week for those 104 weeks. That actually you can get from lots of different sources and you should be able to get, again, Yahoo Finance should have that going back 104 weeks. The, other, the second column is a little, little more difficult. Those are the dividends per month for the S&P 500. I was able to pull them from Bloomberg, and you can also get them, I think, from the S&P website itself. But my suggestion is if you cannot find it, just leave it at zero. I know it's not the right thing to do, but it's not going to throw off your beta by an incredible amount. So essentially, that if you have the, the week-by-week -week dividends, put that number in if you don't just ignore it. The rest of the numbers are basically the regressions. If you look at the bottom of this page, I've essentially created the equivalent of the Bloomberg beta page. Maybe it doesn't look as nice, but I have the intercept, which is what the Bloomberg calls. Yeah. So keep in keeping with the Bloomberg you know, definition of intercept is alpha. I've called it that. You have the slope. Then I also do this, uh, the, the risk-free rate times 1 minus beta and the intercept minus the risk-free rate times 1 minus beta. So my point is, even if you do not have access to a Bloomberg terminal, you can run this regression on your own. Or if you don't trust the Bloomberg beta page, for whatever reason, you can do this yourself. And remember, we did say that the Bloomberg beta page has one flaw in it. It, it doesn't include dividends in the stock returns. When you do it yourself, you can do it right. So you don't have to do this. Obviously, I'll be fine with you using the Bloomberg beta page, but if you choose to do it, it's easy to do. You can use this spreadsheet, and I'll, I'll, I'll link it up, and you can download it. You can use it for any any stock, and, it, and I allow you to enter up to 104 weeks, 60 months. You can do weekly, monthly, whatever you want to do. So I, you have that option if you want it. So let me close it up. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the Bloomberg beta page. And actually, if, uh, you know, one thing, the, the, the numbers on the Bloomberg beta page and the numbers I got on my 
uh, in my regression are very close. My beta was 1.1877, Bloomberg's beta is 1.192. My intercept is 0.06%, Bloomberg's is 0.078%. And that's the little difference is because of the dividend effect. My R squared, I don't report it, but the R squared that Bloomberg is reporting is, uh, no, I, I do report it, it's now 70 point, and Bloomberg's R squared is a little higher, 71.1%. The standard error of the beta is 0 0.076. Now, do with it what, what you can. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the Bloomberg beta page and use it to kind of disentangle things that I'd like to know about Disney. So this is the spreadsheet, and this is another spreadsheet I'll, I'll add on that you can download that allows you to take the regression beta page, or the Bloomberg beta page, and convert those raw numbers into output. So the first, the first item, so I'll make this a little bigger so it's easier to read. So the first item I ask you is, are you using weekly or monthly returns? So you can enter M or W for obvious reasons, and W will make it weekly. That's just so that I know what to convert your risk-free rate. Then I ask you for the current risk-free rate. This is the current 10-year T-bond rate. This is to get the expected return, so this should be as of today, what is the long-term default free rate? Let me take that back. It might not be the T-bond rate if you're working with some other currency. It should be the long-term risk-free rate in that currency. And if you remember, last week's webcast was about getting that number. Then I ask you for a risk premium, right? Remember, there were two ways of getting risk premiums in the U.S. You could use a historical premium, which is about 4.2% in, in February 2013, or an implied premium, which is closer to 5.5%. But then you have this added complication of what if you're in riskier markets? Because the risk premium you should be using here shouldn't just reflect the country in which your company is incorporated, but also the regions of the world it operates in. Now, that's not difficult to get. Most companies break it down. And in fact, this spreadsheet, in my attempt to be helpful, and might or might not be, is a worksheet which allows you to do this. So again, let me blow this up a little bigger so you can see it. And what this allows you to do is if you know where your revenues are, either by country or by broad region, then I have built into the spreadsheet the country risk premiums by country and by region. So here's what you need to do. For your company, if you can find out where the revenues are, in fact, I give you a choice of either using revenues, assets, or earnings. Just be consistent. If you choose one, stick with it. I prefer to use revenues because I trust them more than I trust accounting earnings or assets. But here's what you need to do. You need to find out how much revenue your company gets by country. So for instance, if I had a Latin American company which had, which broke down its revenues in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Honduras, Mexico, and it had some revenues in the US, you'd enter the revenues. Then I compute the weights based on those revenues. There's a lookup table built into the spreadsheet where I will look up the country, the total risk premium by country and compute a weighted average. I'm really helpful that way. Or if you can't get the country, if you can get only by region, which is often more common with big multinationals, I can use that. So let me, as an illustration, take Disney as of 2013. Actually, it's interesting because I did use, I, I have been using Disney in class, but there I've treated it as just a developed market company. And in 2009, I could have gotten away with it. In 2013, if you look down, look at the breakdown of revenues for Disney, and this comes out of the 2012 annual reports. It just came out a week ago. This is what their breakdown looks like. 31.77 billion in the U.S. and Canada, which are mature markets with no country risk. 6,223 million in Europe, which is part mature, part who knows. Uh, 2.99 billion in Asia Pacific and 1.295 billion in Latin America. And they don't break it down by country. So here's your second choice. If you can go by region, and that's what I've done, so essentially you go in, uh, all the other numbers, you don't have to touch, just go in and enter the numbers by region, which is what I've done for Disney. Again, I compute a weighted average by region and built into the spreadsheet, at the, at the last worksheet to the right, are the weighted average equity risk premiums by region, weighted by their GDP. So basically Latin America is going to be heavily weighted by Brazil. Asia is going to be weighted with China a lot, and maybe India the second most. But it's a weighted average of these regions. So the risk premium I would use for Disney, which is what I'm looking at right now, the, the Bloomberg sheet that I'm going to be using is for Disney, is 6.18%. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to take the Disney to the, the most updated Disney Bloomberg beta page and use it to kind of update the information on Disney. And I'm going to use Excel spreadsheet to do it. Okay? So this is Dis Disney 
2011 through 2013, the last two years of weekly. It's exactly the same numbers you'll see in the Excel spreadsheet that I had. So let's start at the top. Are you using weekly or monthly returns? The default, I left it in, in this particular case, I left the default at weekly. If you remember in class, I used monthly five years. Here I decided to leave it at weekly, so I, you know, I'm going to enter W. Then I asked for the current risk-free rate. I'm going to enter the 10-year T-bond rate as of right now. Okay? I don't know what that is. I think it's pretty close to 2%. Nice round number, so let me pick 2. Then the risk premium, of course, I just showed you, is a weighted average risk premium of the different regions of the world that Disney operates in. I got that out of the annual report. Try doing that for your company. For the beta, I'm going to enter the Bloomberg beta, the raw beta, not the adjusted beta, because remember we said the adjusted beta is kind of useless. It just moves the raw beta towards 1, so I entered 1.192. For the standard error of the beta, I'm going to use the 0 0.076 that you see over here, so 0 0.076. The intercept, and I told you that Bloomberg was incredibly sloppy about the way it reports intercepts in R squares. The intercept is already in percent, so it's 0 0.078 percent. And here's the final number, and this is a little tricky. I ask you what the risk-free rate was over the two-year period of the regression. Not right now, but the two-year period. And I want a T-bill rate, not a T-bond rate. Because what I'm trying to compute here is what I'd have made on one-month return intervals over the last two years. So this is not a long-term risk-free rate. It's a short-term rate. It's a, it's a backward-looking number. That's how you explain why it's not 2%. It's 0.25%. It's the average T-bill rate over the last two years for the U.S., uh, if you're working with some other currency, I have a few currencies listed here. If you don't find your currency, I just enter 4% as your annual risk-free rate. Many emerging markets are going to get a pretty high short-term rate even. That's pretty much it. The rest is all output. So here's what I do. I take your risk-free rate of 0.25%. I look to see whether you entered monthly or weekly. If you entered weekly, I divide by 52. If you entered monthly, I'll divide by 12. In fact, if you want to see that change, just go in and change this to monthly, and you'll see my numbers start to change. There you go. So basically, let me go back and fix this because this is weekly. But if you enter monthly, I divide by 12. So that's my risk-free rate times 1 minus beta. My Jensen's alpha is the difference between my intercept and my risk-free rate times 1 minus beta. So on a monthly basis, over the last two years, Disney's done 0.079% better than expected. I annualize it. And the way I annualize it is I take 1 plus that monthly or weekly, you know, Jensen's alpha. And here again, that's where I check to see whether you're entering weekly or monthly. And you analyze it, annualize it by raising to the power of 52. If you want to take a shortcut, multiply by 52, you're going to get a number fairly close. But as the larger the Jensen's alpha becomes, the more the annualization matters. For the 67% range, I just add and subtract one standard error to my 1.192. So the 60. So you see the range between 1.27 and 1.12. For the 95% range, it's two standard errors. For my expected return, I take your risk-free rate whatever currency you've chosen, plus your beta, 1.192, times the 6.18% that reflects where you operate, and you got your expected return. That, as I said, as we talked about, is not just your expected return as an investor investing in Disney stock. It's Disney's cost of equity, if you trust the regression beta. Now, I did mention that I don't trust regression betas. We'll talk about what you might be able to replace it with, but even if you replace it, the structure of what we just did is going to stay the same. So let's review. The first step in this process is to get that regression output. You can either do it yourself in an Excel spreadsheet, entering prices for your stock, the dividends on your stock, the levels of the index and the dividends in the index, and running the regression yourself, which is easy to do in Excel. It's just a little bit of grunt work. It took me 25 minutes to do that Excel spreadsheet, so it wasn't a lot of time. Or you can go to, if you can find a Bloomberg and you can find your company and you type in beta, you'll get that beta page and you take the outputs from the, from the beta page and you either use my spreadsheet, which isn't rocket science, you could do the same thing yourself, or build your own to essentially look at how good or bad your stock was as an investment. And using Disney for the last two years, it's been a pretty good investment. Not a great investment, but 4.19% is not bad. It's a pretty risk. It's been a pretty risky investment, 1.19. Uh, but there's a range even around that beta. The interesting thing, though, is if you look at the output from the regression, is that R squared of 71.1%. If you remember the regression we did in class for Disney, it's 2004 to 2008, the R squared is 41%. You see, what's changed? What's changed was 2008. That crisis, in a sense, has created this, this long-term impact on R squares. Greater proportions of risk in more companies come from macroeconomic factors now, market factors than they used to. Maybe this too shall pass. 
but that's what you're seeing in the R squared is a greater proportion of the risk in Disney and most of the companies is market risk now which makes it a little more difficult to do valuation because it means that the macro is going to overwhelm the micro but that's for another day I hope you found this webcast useful and I hope you get to work on your regression beta page because that's really what this is all about is getting your hands uh, dirty by working on the numbers that's it